Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining me for TRG 30. And today I want to take a moment to pause and send the best possible energy and thoughts to our friends and colleagues in the storm and fire ravaged locations in America's Gulf Coast and Western states. Here in Colorado, we know the terror of fires and those realities well. So please, everyone, let's just today send good energy to the people affected for their resilience and for the energy of firefighters, rescue workers, uh, all of them. Thanks so much for that moment. Today, here we are, let's regroup. TRG 30, where we talk bold change for our sector's resilience. And this week, I want to surface to you a new challenge, a new challenge. I'm seeing our sector, which is a big part of the global creative sector and industries in a different kind of, of crisis, a crisis that goes beyond the pandemic and racism and the environmental challenges we're facing now. It's a crisis of creativity. And my guest today, our guest, has added mightily to my thinking. There's a lot to talk about. And as a result, there will be no formal Q&A today at the end. But please, as your questions and provocations come, enter them into the Q&A. Stephen is going to be taking uh, a look at those as we go. He may interrupt us because of what you're saying. Depending on the volume and type of things that get raised, we'll either respond one-on-one -on -one to you, it's my commitment always to you, or we may pick this conversation up at the end or in another session. So please don't, don't be shy. We also recognize that you may just need to sit back and listen and process today. So you decide. Always, I welcome your feedback. Look forward to hearing from you. Stephen's going to be keeping an eye on you. So with that set up, I'd like to introduce my, my guest, Rahaf Harfouche. She's a digital anthropologist, a strategist, and a best-selling author who focuses on the intersections between emerging technology, innovation, and digital culture. She does this at the Red Thread Institute of Digital Culture, where she is executive director. Rahaf teaches innovation and emerging business models at Science Politique School of Management and Innovation in Paris. Before that, she was the associate director of the Technology Pioneer Program at the World Economic Forum in Geneva, where she helped identify disruptive startups that improve the state of the world. It's her third book, this one here, entitled Hustle and Float. It was released in 2019. It caught my attention. Actually, it was the subhead, Reclaim Your Creativity and Thrive in a World Obsessed with Work. The book focuses on her now longtime work and analysis of workplace culture. Uh, this, this cultural sector that we're in is, at this time, after I picked up the book and read it, I began to see that we're operating seemingly without so much of the creativity that got us here in the first place during this pandemic. And, and in reading the book, I began to see a crisis that began to unfold actually well before the pandemic. We're gonna talk about this with her today. Her first book, uh, which was entitled, Yes We Did, an insider's look at how social media built the Obama brand chronicled her experiences as a member of Barack Obama's digital media team during the 2008 elections. She's been speaking on digital culture and tech since 2006. There are six, there are many, many awards. And yet today, here's what I want you to be listening for. Context. So as Rahab and I talk, um, how does this conversation and her research does it affirm or challenge your own perspective second listen for reframing is there an opportunity as you are thinking about or now rebuilding your teams to use these thoughts and research research to think about what would be ideal to ensure your top creative energy and productivity of your team and then finally always action. 
Is there a way that you can see? We will talk about it, uh, that you could act differently to enact this change for your organization's resilient future. So it's with that, in fact, that I now want to welcome Rahav Harfush to TRG30 and to begin our conversation. Welcome to you, Rahav. Thank you so much for making time today uh, with us. And, um, you know, I, I have set up this context of your research and, and work and, and why the book caught my attention. But this book is now um, being talked about and vetted and socialized in the context of a, of a pandemic. Can you just, um, can you reflect on that for us? How does that thought, how has that affected your thinking about this work? So um, Hustle and Float is really uh, the story of our own relationship with our work. And it's not a book that tells you, oh, like you should take a break or you should take a nap or you should do some yoga like we all know. I was more interested in why is it that high performing creative professionals that are really passionate about their work, why do so many of us push ourselves to burnout or to exhaustion despite having information that would help us avoid it. And what I realized is that there is a historical story, a social story, a biological story of all these little threads that have come together to create a belief system that is very, very deeply entrenched. Even for me, I was surprised. Even to this day, I still find myself detangling it in my own thinking. That's how embedded it is in our psyche mm -hmm. about success and hard work and deservingness and and all of these things that we tell each other um, are the rules of what it takes to be successful in our society. And what the pandemic has done is that it's taken all of those beliefs, all of the, the contradictions, all of those challenges, and it's really amplified them. So in uh, a pre-pandemic world where people were already battling enough distractions, we now place them in the context of a, of a huge global upheaval where they also have to not only manage the regular distractions of their jobs, technology, notifications, emails, messages, now there's like breaking news and uh, fires and political stuff and kids at home and elder care and health care about the virus and, and and, 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 and. Right. So already our over like our overwhelmed brains have to grapple with so much more, which is making it incredibly difficult. You mentioned, now, we, yeah, yeah. Oh, please, you mentioned no, no, go before, ahead. We, before we um, uh, started today, the, the discussion about the economic recovery, but you said, Jill, there's a human recovery, a human element. I'm sure you were just, just going to speak to that. Yeah, that's a good, that's that's actually perfect timing. Um, yeah, so we have all this over distraction, and then what's happening is in this like huge upheaval where our brains are being pulled in a thousand different directions, organizations everywhere have had to completely reinvent how they do their business. All of a sudden, people can't go into offices. Entire industries are gutted. Like we know, we don't have to rehash it. We're all living it. Mm -hmm. And the funny, the irony is, is that now everybody who are in these roles are being challenged to rush towards an economic recovery. What can we do to just like bounce back? Where's the innovation? Where are the ideas? Where's the creativity? But you can't have economic recovery without personal creative recovery. And we're witnessing a trauma, psychological trauma and a burnout on a huge scale. And those things, the impact of distractions, the impact of trauma, the economic turbulence, that is making it impossible for people to wrap their head around coming up with a new solution or coming up with a new business model. So we're really in the stage where a lot of the tensions that we feel about work are, 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 are kind of like amplifying, not to mention we have a culture that's obsessed with being busy all the time. And now we're obsessed with showing people that we're busy because we're working from home. And if our boss can't see us working, how am I going to prove to my boss that I'm working? I better send more emails, more contacts, more Zoom meeting, more Slack, AKA more distractions that take away from the precious time that we have to think of the ideas and the solutions that are going to get us through through this mess and also for ourselves to recover enough so that we're in the headspace that we can imagine our way out of this 
So the um, arts and cultural sector, the creative sector, I'm going to ask you to give us a little bit of history here because it's fascinating. But this, I mean, this hits on what I was observing. We are a creative sector who one of our guests um, earlier in the year, Dr. Tony Byer, somebody asked a question and he said, well, you all are the creative folks, you should be able to come up with really creative solutions to this. And that's what triggered my thinking. I thought, boy, we are we are, and yet we aren't always, and we aren't always capable of it. And some of what you're describing here, which is pandemic related, but not entirely pandemic related. There's this, um, the, you know, the first 75% of this book is thoroughly interesting and highly vetted research about um, even before the turn of the last century work, um, uh, uh, um, not habits, but protocols. Can you just sort of give us a thumbnail? You do it so well of from what your book describes as first class men up to today's work warrior kind of culture. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to try to do this really quick because I know we have a lot uh, to get through, but there's two like fundamental ideas that for a long time historically mm. were quite parallel to each other and didn't intersect. So productivity, which is like performance management, the way we talk about create, uh, productivity today was something that was done in army and in military and government institutions. And then it was taken over by the industrial revolution and has been has been drawn upon for businesses to this day, as we see in the latest AI performance tracking software. And that model was based on an ideology that was developed for people that were building, manufacturing things on assembly lines, something that was tangible. So if I said to you, Jill, how many cars or how many widgets did you build in a day? You had the answer and I could see the answer right there. And so that was sort of one parallel. Creativity has evolved in a very different way, whereas many people don't know, but for a long time in human history, people didn't think that humans could be creative. People thought that creativity was a gift that was given to us by the gods. It was something that was gifted to us. And then we thought it was something that um, only geniuses had. And then we thought, no, this is a skill that people had. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really until social psychology that we started looking at it as a skill set, measuring if you could be, you know, creative creative. And then now creativity has undergone this transformation where it has become a unit of economic output. Now creativity is our business. It's what we do. It's what we're paid for. And so now in order for us to judge our economic output, we're using productivity metrics that were designed to build widgets, but we're trying to apply it to industries that create like ideas. And yeah. if I said to you, well, Jill, how many ideas do you come up with in an hour? You'd be like, well, that's totally absurd. And that's the point. The systems that we put into place, we've taken creativity and productivity, we fuse them together, but in a way that doesn't make sense in a way that was never designed for the type of work that we are doing. And not only do these systems, not only were these systems never made for this type of work, they actively hurt our capacity to perform this type of work. And when I started uncovering that, I kept thinking to myself, well, this is this is so wild that as creatives, we are willingly participating in systems that work against our capacity to tap into our highest levels of performance. Why? And you know, the, so the answer is belief systems, culture, the stories we tell ourselves in the media about what success looks like and who gets to be successful. One of the things that I that really hit me around this, you know, the, the notion of an assembly line and the 40 hour work week which for, you know, I don't know um, how many in this virtual room are working 40 hours a work week. It's probably more than that, actually, especially now. But those protocols and that paradigm was built for a time that's different than now. And there's somewhere in the book where you describe the, the, the research that's been done that suggests that the creative brain actually requires fewer hours of scheduled work because rest is also required. Did I get that right? Yes, absolutely. It's, can I just say, it just makes me so happy when like, I mean, it's been so lovely to, to hear how much like this book meant to you because when I wrote it, I honestly thought I was just like screaming into the void. And so <laughs> you absolutely, you absolutely got it. The 40 hours and nine to five is 
arbitrary. Like it's, it's those numbers were based on the industrial era negotiations where it was eight hours for work, eight hours for sleep and eight hours for um, just like a, a, like a, a recreation. And we, and, and eight hours happened to be the time that worked best for like manual labor, right? For, for industrial era labor. Now, cognitive scientists, neuroscientists, we're starting to know that our capacity to focus on highly, highly cognitive tasks. So when we're ideating or researching or figuring something out or writing or creating, we can't do that nonstop for eight hours. And actually it looks more like six hours is our max. And after six hours, we get tapped out and you could push. And I know many of us push, but then what happens is you just get tired. The quality of your work goes down. The fatigue goes up. You make more mistakes. And the worst part is if you keep pushing, your ability to bounce back is actually also compromised. So maybe even the next day, you're not really back to where you would have been if you had taken an appropriate time to rest. So um, creativity and creative workers. If I'm an accountant, I might say, that doesn't apply to me. Uh, if I'm in marketing, I might say, I don't know. I mean, I, I know that my creative staff, my art, my artists and production staff, I can see they're creative. Um, just uh, you're talking about a broad category of people who have to use knowledge in a, in a particular way. Yeah, for so long, the word creativity, because, and in the book I go through it, I don't have time to go through it now, but the history of the word um, has been something that has been such a hot topic. Like some people have a visceral reaction. I used to teach in university. Um, I, I'm, in, I, I'm in the business school now, but I used to teach for the masters, of, in, the masters of economics and finance. And financial students were like, I don't identify as creative. I'm not creative. That's not how I see myself, as though it's an either or. But creativity at a fundamental level is your brain's ability to make connections between different things to create something novel and new. It's problem solving, it's solutions, it's creation. And knowledge work is based on creativity. If you're an accountant and you have to find a solution or you have to understand the story that the books are telling you, I used to work in data and I used to take um, accounting courses at business school, that's a creative process. If you're a lawyer, if you're in operations, if you're in leadership, if you have to sit and look at your team and try to figure out what's the best way to move our company towards its goals? What's the best way to manage and encourage my team? What's the best way to launch a new product? What's the best way to connect with consumers? Right. That's all like creative, creative work. work. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's the key. Okay. So you said um, uh, history here standards, protocols don't serve us, mm -hmm. systems are, you, it would be easy to say the system and the history is responsible. But in fact, um, you said something important, uh, our beliefs and we are responsible, like we are our systems, right? Like we are our government. So the individual accountability piece that our beliefs get in the way here, don't they? Yeah, so the book is structured where I call them the hidden forces because there are things that influence our thinking. I think uh, David Foster Wallace, I think that's the name, you know, he referred to as, as, as a fish doesn't know it's swimming in water. And that's kind of how I think about it. There are ideas about work that we just take to be true that we've never stopped to look at. It's just a part of what we think the world is, what we think reality and truth are. And so one of them is the systems, but those systems eventually create a story, a relationship that we build between how we place ourselves in that system. And some of that belief system could be things like, for example, hard work always pays off. If I work hard enough, I'll be successful. Yeah. Um, you know, things like that, that you don't really question them. It's not like you ever hold it up to a piece of paper and say, okay, do I really believe this? Where did this come from? It's just yeah. something that you absorb. And once you start understanding how these stories are influencing you, then you have a personal accountability to be quite intentional about whether or not those narratives serve you or they don't serve you. And I always say intentionality here, because if you look at me and you say, you know what, I'm perfectly happy. I actively and consciously choose these narratives and, I, and they are serving me, then okay, like more power to you. But more often than not, you will look and you'll say, these narratives are making me act in ways that go against my own creative best interests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I say the personal accountability piece because people come to me and they say, what can the company do? What can the company do to make things better? What policy should we have as a company? Mm -hmm. And your company can have the best policy. You can have free food and nap rooms and days off and unlimited paid vacations and all the perks in the world. 
And if you as an individual feel like if you don't actively demonstrate to your boss and your team how hard you're working, if you're not demonstrating your work ethic, how much you're willing to sacrifice for your work, how much you're willing to prove how much you want the opportunities, then you will not take advantage of those policies, even if they exist. And it's all in the name of our ability to be the most creative and innovative leaders and team members we can be. Okay, team, um, TRG team, let's put the poll up. All of you listening, we have a series of these beliefs. Rahav's, um, I think it's the chapter 13, has a place where you have to look at your own belief systems related to work. And I want you to just check off um, where you think and where you um, uh, relate to these uh, set statements and belief systems. And as we do that, Rav, you're going to see, like I am, how people are filling out these um, uh, answers or checking these boxes. And you ask these questions all the time. So I'm really curious about um, if there are surprises in how our group is responding or if, um, you know, if anything in particular stands out to you. If I rest, I'll fall behind at work. That is one that's top, you know, at the top of the pack here. I'm too old to change careers. Work is difficult and full of stress. I'll never be so able where, to make money to so do So where do you money. see the where do you see the results? Can I see the results? Oh, I see them. They just came up right now. Perfect. Yeah, so the biggest one is if I rest, I'll fall behind. And in the context of COVID, in the context of a sector that has been so dramatically affected, I, I hear it all the time. This, um, I, must, I must work hard right now on behalf of my community and my institution. I don't know if that's unique to our particular sector or you see it everywhere. It's, it's everywhere and it's because we have this idea that performance is about continuous output. We have this idea that we have to fill every hour of our day with active output. Whereas in reality, what we need to do is that every period of active high performance work needs to be balanced with an intentional period of recovery. So what do I mean by like, when I say rest, or what do I mean by like intentional recovery? It means that you understand that when you take a break, you're not diverting from your goals, you're not wasting time, you're not slacking off, that when you take an active intentional rest with, with focus on recuperating and on replenishing your energy, that that is a part of high performance. That is a part of the process as a leader of doing the marathon work of building a business. And many people right now think, and I've seen this in interviews with creatives, if I rest, I'll fall behind. Mm -hmm. If I rest, uh, people won't think that I'm committed enough to my vision. If I rest, people will say I'm slacking off, that we think that any time not spent actively productive is a waste of time. So when I say we have to take personal accountability, I mean that we as individuals have to actually reframe how we look at performance with teams in our organization and say performance isn't just people working really hard. That's half the equation. The other half of the equation is how are we designing systems where people can rest and people can let their brains rest and let their brains be de-stimulated for a while. The, the, I see Stephen coming on. The, the, there's this metaphor that isn't a metaphor, actually. I think there are firms now um, around this idea of, of athletic performance in the workplace. And you describe this consulting approach that actually, at first, I was feeling critical about it, and then I was, and then I was learning about how they're te how they're teaching, you know, these big Fortune 50 company executives that high performance also, if, if you're an athlete, high performance also requires rest so that the body can contribute at the highest level. And there are corollaries. There are corollaries, it seemed. Well, yeah, in the book we talk about um, the corporate athlete and how everyone, the way we talk about, about work right now is very funny because we talk about it like it's a high impact sport, right? There's executive performance and high performance and there's all these like big words. And then somebody said to me the other day, they said, well, you know, Michael Jordan, he was like the hardest working athlete and you know, he works really hard. And I said like NBA players have entire off seasons, <laughs> yeah. have entire off seasons. And so, you know, Michael Jordan has entire days off 
where he's not playing. And if you watch the documentary on Netflix, he says that the days not spent at the gym are just as important as the days spent at the gym, because there's no point in pushing your body to the limit and not letting it recover because then you'll just destroy your body. Okay. Okay. So there, there's lots of, I don't know what you're seeing, uh, Stephen, but what I know is that people always <laughs> want to know what to do. And in fact, you have a TED talk. We, we distributed it. And I'd love to hear as we wrap up here, um, some of the things that, that you did differently, Rahav, to make adjustments. But here's some things that we think you could be doing as an individual in a workplace on your behalf and perhaps to influence culture around you first examine your core beliefs about work. You saw some of them in that poll. And then you have to design, design your own um, specific needs. We each have to do our own work about how to get the best out of our own um, person on behalf of an idea or creative work. You can talk with each other about this topic and discover with each other how do you get the best out of your time and your creative pursuits and then just begin to model the behavior that you desire to see. Stephen, um, I'm, I'm curious what you're seeing in the Q&A function if, if you would characterize it. Yeah, I'm, you know, I imagine everyone as I was was intently listening and, and I say this conversation's given me incredible energy actually <laughs> when we talk about rest but energy but there is a real <laughs> about approach to working but also what is rest like what rest do we need and that's an app that's a fantastic question rest means a time when your brain is not being actively stimulated. So that doesn't mean that you step away from your computer and go sit down with your phone and you're still getting stimulated and distracted on social media. It means that you go somewhere and you just sit quietly and you let your brain just take a second without having something coming at it. And if you think about our culture today, we're not bored anymore. Like we have a culture today where no matter where you are or what you're doing, you have something stimulating that is coming at your brain, whether, I mean, now we're all at home, but in the before times, it was like, whether you're at the airport or the coffee shop or a meeting or at a restaurant, we have all this information. And what's happening on a neurological level, this is my digital anthropology hat, but what's happening on a neurological level is that our brain is becoming addicted to these micro doses of stimulation where they say something like the average person swipes or interacts with their phone like 2,600 times during the day. Mm -hmm. And that that's what's happening constantly. And what we need on a neurological level to rest our brains to become creative is we actually just need quiet, not undistracted time where we're not being like stimulated by all of these devices. As I expected, we are um, totally running out of time and we had an experiment that we were going to put on all of you. Rah Rahab was going to ask you to take your hands off of your device and just for six <laughs> seconds not do anything. This morning on my walk when I'm usually listening to music because of this work, I didn't do anything. I tried not to work, think. I just tried to be for 30 minutes. It was, it was something. Um, Stephen, take us to the next tile where we queue up the things that are coming. Um, we've got Birmingham Royal Ballet, who's going to be live from the stage. We're going to be talking more about this kind of things um, with a thoracic surgeon who's going to be talking with us about resiliency bank accounts, what good governance looks like. And with Robbie Kelman-Baxter, we're going to be making a case uh, for membership and subscription, even to, in today's pandemic environment. Listen, Rahav, um, I cannot, we cannot thank you enough. And the, the, the thoughts and Q&As that have come into us, we will be responding to directly. But I wonder if there's one thing that you would share as we send people off here that they could do to just be the most um, innovative and creative and resilient person during this pandemic time and beyond? Um, our species has always been one with incredible imagination. We have the capacity to create wonderful futures and wonderful solutions. And as creatives, we should step up to the responsibility of designing systems that were made 
by us, for us, to enable us to create the systems that we need, to create the environment that we need in order to do the work that we're called to do. So I hope the message is that you have the ability to get to know yourself, get to know your creative rhythms, get to know what your, you know, the length of your cycle, what you really need to be your ultimate creative self, and then to talk to your teammates and your organizations and to ask yourself, why is this system in place? Why do we meet on this place? Why is our email policy this? And just ask yourself the question, are these technologies and tools, are they helping us create our best work or are they distracting us from creating our best work? And start from there. Rahav Harfush, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for joining us for TRG30. We'll see you next week.